Does he deserve it all? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, choir and musicians, for this blessing of music today. Before you're seated, since this is the first Sunday of a new year, I want to be very open with you. I want Sandra to come up with me, please. And I don't want to begin this year without you knowing that we desperately need your prayers. I can't do this. This thing God has called me to do is impossible without God. This is the most foolish thing in the world without God. God sent us here to shepherd this church, and we can't do it without God. Without Him, we can do nothing. We can't carry the load. We can't pray the prayers. We just can't. But God is able, you see. So I'm asking as many council and elder members as we have and their wives to come up on the stage as quickly as you can, please. We want to surround ourselves with your prayers. And when they all get here, I want you to also extend your hand in this direction. This is serious business to us. This is our whole life. Church, listen. I'm not a professional. I'm a preacher. And preaching is done through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's only effective if the Word is preached. But much terror and agony will follow those who preach and live the Word. But God is able, and God is faithful. And He has kept us these 47-plus years. He's able to keep us every day that He's assigned us to this planet. So come on in. Lay your hands on us, please. Don't Just go ahead and pray out loud, and you join too, please. <laughs> the Lord bless you. Walk out knowing that His angels are your bodyguards. His spirit is your guide and light. His blood is your salvation. His Father is our Father. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. The Lord bless you. We'll see you next time unless Jesus comes. Hallelujah. And the whole church said amen. amen. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters. We depend greatly on your prayers and counsel all the time. And you. God bless you. As they find their seat. I don't know, you know, if people, again, think preachers are just dramatic people or what. We are. This is a life and death struggle. After 12 o'clock last night, I didn't sleep a wink. I lay and prayed and wrestled with the Lord about the message this morning. So what I give to you, I give to you by faith that God's word is for you today. Um, you came here to hear God's word. Almost everybody I know is in a struggle of some sort. It's like people have realized we're in a desperate warfare. The devil is desperate, and we've got to be desperate believers. But I want to tell you something. God has a word for you this morning. And it is not my word. I'm just the message giver. I am the courier. You will hear my voice, but it will be the word of the living God. And when it is spoken, it is spoken for eternity, and it will not return to God void. 
it will accomplish what He means for it to accomplish. Thank you for being seated. <coughs> I'm in the 48th chapter of Genesis. Some rich, rich soil right here. This is about Jacob and Joseph. And we all know the up and down life of Jacob. Uh, his character was questionable many times, but God had his hand on him. He was tricked a number of times. He was a deceiver. He tricked his own dad into giving him a blessing. So now we come to that stage of Jacob's life. He's 147 years old. Now remember, Jacob had 12 sons. One of those sons was Joseph, his beloved, his favorite. And this son made all the other brothers mad. He was arrogant. If I had a sibling that said, one day you'll worship me, I'd throw him in a well too. <laughs> I'd sell him to somebody. <clears throat> and that's what he did. He didn't have enough sense to understand that God was using him and made his brothers so mad that they did indeed sell him and he ended up in Egypt, but God was with him. And in Egypt, God showed him favor in Potiphar's house for a while. And then, of course, you know the false accusation and now he's thrown into prison again, but God was with him. And it's, it is honestly the, one of the most beautiful stories. I could read it over and over and over again. He's in there for something he didn't do, but God was with him. And at God's timing, in God's way, God brought him out because he could read visions and interpret dreams. And Pharaoh had one, and he interpreted it, and... God moved the heart of the king, and the king suddenly declared Joseph to be the second greatest power in the empire. And all of a sudden, the prisoner became the prince. But God had a reason for his pain. He always does. He has a reason for every anxious moment, every dark, tearful night, every strike of fear to the heart. He has a reason for it. And that reason was to preserve Israel's lineage. So a famine came to the land of Canaan, and Joseph's brothers came down to buy some corn. And you know that story. They finally all ended up coming down with their father Jacob. And now Joseph and Jacob are about to meet. Remember, Jacob's 147 years old now. Many, many decades ago, he thought Joseph was torn to pieces by a wild animal. He thought he had lost his son. He said, I'll never see him again. But God knows what he's doing. And so when the brothers got into the court of Joseph, and he revealed himself to them. They thought, well, now he's going to kill us. He's going to pay us back. Here's what he said. You didn't put me here. God put me here. You'll have to forgive me this morning. Just let me be who I am, all right? This stuff tears me up. I see the goodness of God, the hand of God. When nobody else can see things, God knows what he's doing. You didn't put me here. It was God that put me here to preserve your life. You tried to kill mine, but God sent me here to save yours. <clears throat> so they brought their father down, and they're about to meet. And it goes something like this. Jacob is talking to Joseph. Now Joseph comes into the room, and Joseph has two sons now, Ephraim and Manasseh. 
These are Jacob's grandsons. Long ago, as I was returning from Paddan Aram, Rachel died in the land of Canaan. She's telling Joseph what he's been through. We were still on the way some distance from Bethlehem, so with great sorrow I buried her there beside the road. <coughs> then Jacob looked over at the two boys. Are these your sons? He said. Yes, Joseph told him. These are the sons God has given me here in Egypt. And Jacob said, bring them closer to me so I can bless them. Jacob was half blind because of his age and could hardly see. So Joseph brought the boys close to him, and Jacob kissed and embraced them. Listen to these words, church. Then Jacob said to Joseph, I never thought I'd see your face again, but now God has let me see your children too. God just has a way of bringing life out of death, something from nothing. When Jacob thought his son was gone, in God's timing, he was blessed threefold. He saw his son and two grandsons. So, Jacob is sitting there now, and Joseph moved the boys who were at their grandfather's knees, and he bowed with his face to the ground. Then he positioned the boys in front of Jacob. With his right hand, he directed Ephraim towards Jacob's left hand. And with his left hand, he put Manasseh at Jacob's right hand. Now, here's what he was doing. You see, the right hand always blessed the eldest. The eldest was heir to the throne and to the riches, to whatever. So Joseph, facing his father, took the oldest and moved him over to Jacob's right hand and put the youngest on Jacob's left hand. And then he bowed down with his face in the dust. But when he looked up, Jacob had done this. And he said, Father, no, that's not the way it works. You see, he thought his dad was just really old and more than half blind, and maybe just a little senile. He didn't know what he was doing. Uh, Dad, you can't do that. That's not the way it works. The eldest goes under this blessing, and the younger one <coughs> on this side, it doesn't work that way. And Jacob said, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. Brothers and sisters, I wonder if that's a lesson we need to learn about living every day, trusting in the Lord with all of our hearts. When we come to God with a need that absolutely we cannot handle, when we come with broken hearts, swollen faces from crying, and we present our petitions to God, and somehow God seems to be doing it backwards, and we think, surely He's not blind to this situation. Surely the ancient of days is not too old to know what I just prayed for. Surely he sees what I need. Of course he does. But God's in the business of doing things the opposite way. And God's in the business of doing things with the weak instead of the strong. And God's in the business of picking out those nobody else would pick out. And God is in the business of answering prayers His way for His glory and His honor. And it's always better for me. So if in your life and in this situation you're facing now, you've kind of laid it out before God and in your understanding, uh, it can't be any other way. It has to work out this way. You just have to remember again his thoughts are higher than your thoughts and His ways than your ways. His thoughts are higher than the sun and His ways cannot be comprehended because He's an eternal, infinite, holy, wonderful God. And everything you're looking at, you're looking at through a skewed human perspective with very little understanding. You know that, don't you? We see through a glass darkly. 
and we don't understand things fully. We know of bits and pieces, and somehow we think that that's what God has to work with, but He's an infinitely wise and sovereign God, and in God's understanding and in His wisdom, He just may choose to cross His hands and bless you in a way you had not even begun to imagine. Because God says, eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and it hasn't even entered to the heart of a man the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. It could just be here today that God's going to reveal to somebody who thinks it's over and sees no way out that he has just decided to cross his hands. But when he's finished, you will not only see your son's face, but you will see your grandchildren's face. If you know what I'm saying, God is not too small. His hand is not too small. His arm is not too short. He does not have a deaf ear and he is not blind. He's a great, big, wonderful God who knows what you need before you even know how to ask for it. <clears throat> I know what I'm doing, son. I know the plans I have for you. <laughs> plans to prosper you, not harm you. Plans, plans to give you hope and a future. That's what God has designed for those that love Him, for His chosen. Remember last Sunday? I stood about right here and quoted that verse of Scripture. That was spoken to a people who were in slavery under harsh conditions people whose hearts were hardened toward him. But in the middle of it all, he said, I know the plans I have for you. These are plans that will prosper you, not harm you. These are plans that will give you hope and a future. I don't really know what any of you are going through, really. I, I, I'm not even sure I know what I'm going through. But I know that there are people here today grasping and wondering where God is. I know you came to church today saying to God, could you speak to me? Can you help me through this situation? And I want to tell you, look in my eyes, please. God has already worked it out. You know, he said, I am the God that knows the end from the beginning. From the beginning, I already knew what the end is. All you got to do is pick up the Bible and you can see what the end is going to be. Did you know that? <clears throat> so where I am right now, this light affliction, which is but for a moment, is producing for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Therefore, our outward man is perishing, but our inward man is being renewed day by day. <clears throat> Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Get your eyes off the situation. Stop listening to the hoots of the devil. Stop resting your understanding on a world that's fading away. Quit looking to people for your strength, your help, and your hope unless they are believers brothers and sisters in Christ who can embrace you and cry with you and help you. No, turn your eyes upon Jesus. He knows what he's going to do. 
As I stand here now preaching to you, you have no idea what the Lord has laid up in store for you. You just don't. It's better than you thought it would be. In fact, <clears throat> if you remember uh, in John chapter 6, when Jesus was teaching and about 5,000 people showed up, and it was late in the day, and Jesus looked at Philip and said, Now, what would you do? In your thinking, in your world, in this society and this economy, what would you do to feed all these people? And Philip said, Why, Lord, if every one of us worked five months and got five months' wages, we couldn't buy enough bread for these people. Now, notice what the Scriptures say. This Jesus asked him to test him, for he already knew what he was going to do. <laughs> Y'all don't seem to get as happy as I do. I'm holding it back here this morning. He already knew what he was going to do, but he said, I'll let you, just let me hear what you think ought to be done. He's doing that to every one of us today. And when I take my eyes off Jesus, and when I listen to somebody else's word other than his word, that's when I begin to think about wages, enough money, how we're going to do this, what's the right way to do it. It's an impossibility. But when I start listening to the one who can take a piece of bread and a couple of fish and just start breaking it off. <laughs> Don't get me started here this morning. <laughs> you understand what went on? Those 12 apostles stood there with baskets and Jesus took a piece of fish and a few little pieces of bread. He said, Bartholomew, come here just a minute. <clears throat> Fill it up. Go, go feed the people. Thomas, come here. And the people are going, what, what is this? Where is he getting all that bread? <laughs> James, come here. Go ahead, Thomas. Feed him. <laughs> Something out of nothing. A whole lot out of a real bit, little bit. That's the way God is. Yes. Folks, there's no limit to what God can no do. Limit. There's no problem too big. No there's too, never too many people. <laughs> Want me to tell you something else? I'm trying not to get off the subject, but I need to tell you something else here. The Bible says they had so much left over that it filled up 12 baskets full. And the very disciples that handed it out got to take a basket full home with them. <clears throat> this is not a small God. This is not a limited God. This is a God that says, ask largely. Ask anything in my name and I will do it. I already know what I'm going to do. A few days ago, I got uh, some information that made me so scared and so sick you ever have those feelings, that hot nausea, and you think you're going to throw up, and fear that makes you sweat? And I had to go up to the bedroom, and I fell down between the bed and the wall in a clump. It was a pitiful, miserable sight to behold. A man in a ball, scared, about to throw up, tears welling up in my eyes. I pulled myself up, got on my knees, and there was my Bible. I had left it on the bed that morning when I left, and I opened it up. Have you ever been there when you don't know what else to do? And I opened that Bible up, and I read these words. I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will never 
be shaken. Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for all of my expectation is from Him. I took a deep breath. The Holy Spirit spoke to me at that moment and said, could it be that you are expecting more from the devil than you are from me? Who heard it? <laughs> are you expect Loran, are you expecting the devil to do more than you're expecting God to do? Oh, you expect the devil to steal, kill, and destroy. You expect fear to rise up inside of you when the news is bad and the outlook is bleak. You expect the devil to run you ragged, chew you out, beat you up, ream your heart out, jerk tears out of your eyes. You expect the devil and his crowd to be stronger than you are. But have you forgotten who I am? What in the world are you looking in that direction for? All of your expectation ought to come from me. So what if the devil steals, kills, and destroys? I'm a God that gives back. I'm a God that raises from the dead. I'm a God of victory. I'm a God of provision. I'm a God of redemption. I'm a God of salvation. There is nothing too hard for me. <laughs> Your enemy is limited. He can only do what I let him do. But there are no limits on you because of me. I'm in you. You are in me. I fill the universe. I made everything by the power of my word. If my word abides in you and you abide in my word, you can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Yes. Who believes what I'm preaching here? So let's just deal with it here for a moment. Let's just deal with it. What are you expecting God to do now? Are you expecting him to give grace and victory, deliverance? Or have you listened to the devil enough that you're worn down and you just don't see any way out of this? Watch, look here, look church! God is able. Someone directed me to Lamentations chapter 3 between services. Listen to this. The thought of my, no, here it is. Everything I had hoped for from the Lord is lost. That's a sad man right there. The thought of my suffering is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet, I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who depend on Him, in those who search for Him, in those who wait quietly for Him. I will say to you again this morning, it may look like it's over, but there is always hope in God because His plans are for your prosperity and your good to give you hope and a future. Somebody ought to shout amen. amen. So, why don't you just watch God work? Why don't you just step back and say, all right, all of my expectation is from you. 
I'm going to watch you work. Because all things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. If you believe it, slip your hand up. Do you believe it? All things. All things. All things. And God has given me, us, the privilege to suffer just like Joseph. He trusted Joseph with suffering. He trusts us with bad situations and pain and problems so that through that, others can be blessed. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask those same council members and their wives to come and gather across the front here as quickly as you can. <clears throat> I told the early service this morning, we're going to do a lot more of this in 2024. We're going to have a lot more family time in church. We're going to pray for one another, care about one another. We're going to bless one another. So, if you are here, of course, if you're here, you're hearing this. But you, you're at a tough place right now. Let me tell you, these people have all been in tough places. Tough place right now. Tough place. Oh, boy, tough places. The people who are most effective in praying are people who pray out of their pain because that is raw faith in God. So I'm going to ask you if you have a need, if you want to give something to Jesus, if you want the Holy Spirit to rise up inside of you and cause you to expect God to do something great, get out of your seat, come down, and they will pray with you. <clears throat> we did it at the early service. We're doing it now. In the satellite buildings down at Lake Park in Wilmington, and even in Weatherby Hall behind us, feel free to come down. We're going to sing. They're going to pray. We're going to worship. And Jesus is going to walk up and down the aisles of this, of this church. Hallelujah.